Hey, what's up guys? My name is Colin. This is the Battle Bridge and today I'm talking about Star Trek Picard Episode 2. I have an appointment. Your name, please, sir. Picard. P-I-C-A-R-D. It's nice to see you up and around again. We have an obligation to investigate. There is no we, Jean. Admiral, I am standing up for the Federation, for what it should still represent. This is no longer your house, Jean. Go home. Now, let's start with the opening of this episode because, man, it was like a horror movie. We're brought 14 years into the past to the Utopia Planitia shipyards on Mars. There's a skeleton crew working, and one of them is a synthetic, an android. His name is F8, or Fate, I guess we're supposed to realize. Now, F8 is decidedly, acutely, purposefully creepy as fuck. Just look at this guy. That dude is lucky. He doesn't this. They hit the uncanny valley pretty hard when it came to the design of these synthetics. And the way this entire opening sequence is shot and scripted, it has more in common with a John Carpenter horror film than most Treks that I've seen. It was actually pretty un-Star Trek-like, if I'm being honest. However, I actually liked it. Now, there are some other things in this episode that are un-Star Trek-like that I didn't like quite as much, but we'll get to those in a minute. Before we do, can we just acknowledge that we got an F-bomb in this episode? And also, more lens flares than if J.J. Abrams was directing. Seriously, they need to pull back on those just a little bit, because in some of these scenes, I honestly can't see shit. Now, after the opening scene, those of us who didn't read the Picard comic leading up to the series learn that Picard's caregivers, let's call them, his live-in friends, are actually former members of the Romulan Tal Shiar, the brutal, secretive, feared Romulan secret police. Okay, now I feel like I should have read that comic. Also, speaking of Romulans and Picard, it seems like we are coming full circle in Star Trek when it comes to their physiology. In the original Star Trek series, Romulans basically looked a lot like humans, or identical to Vulcans. They just had sashes and shit. Then in TNG, every Romulan, male and female, were given really distinct forehead ridges. Not Klingon level, mind you, but very different from the smooth foreheads that TOS presented us with. Now in Picard, it seems like they're reducing those ridges on the forehead, or in some cases, just not including them at all. This is just another example of redesigning species over the course of Trek, but I guess in-universe, maybe we can attribute it to some difference in genetic heritage when it comes to different Romulans. Now, we also learn about an even more secretive organization behind the Tal Shiar called the Jat Vosh. Now, what's the deal with the Jat Vosh? Well, we don't really know much yet. All we do know is that they've been around for a long time and they harbor a deep, resentful, all-consuming hatred for artificial life or synthetics. It's also made clear in this episode that the Borg cube looking object that we saw at the end of episode one is indeed a Borg cube. It is derelict and severed from the collective and has been taken over or infested, if you will, with Romulans looking to harvest the technology within the cube. At least that's how it seems. Now, if they are selling technology out of this Borg cube, that's gotta be a pretty lucrative venture, one that would make even the Ferengi jealous. A very profitable opportunity for all concerned, I might add. Profitable for the Ferengi, maybe. Are you implying something major? Me, not at all, no. The Ferengi reputation speaks for itself. Also, apparently there are active drones, or at least drones in stasis, that are still on the Borg cube. It's kind of amazing after all these years that there would still be parts of the cube that are ungoverned or unclaimed, where there's active drones still walking around and danger of assimilation. Now, obviously the biggest revelation in episode two is that these Jat Vosh characters have deeply infiltrated Starfleet. Now, how long have they been embedded in Starfleet? Were they behind the synthetic attacks on Mars? What's their end game? What do they want with this daughter of data? Well, those are all questions that haven't explicitly been answered yet. All I know is this all has the makings of a really good two-part TNG episode. So as far as the overarching plot goes, I'm liking it. But here's the problem with this episode and Star Trek Picard in general as I see it. This show needs to slow down. Scotty, we need more speed. I'm giving her all she's got, Captain. She can't take anymore. Damn. In my last video, I complained that the first episode was too much info dumping, too much expository dialogue, too much jumping from scene to scene, place to place, character to character, without any room to breathe. 
and I think episode two suffers from the same problem. Scenes just move too fast in this show, and it seems as if dialogue isn't written to engage us or to further develop the characters, it's written to cram information down our throat in the shortest amount of time possible. And that is at least in part a consequence of having this show operate under an overarching mega plot and not episodically like treks of days past. Because of the need this show has to keep a very complex plot rolling through reveal after reveal and the need to jump around from different scene to different scene, different character to different character, everything just feels so rushed. There's just simply no time to breathe and no time to get to know any of these new characters. And that simply wasn't the case when it came to old treks. In most Star Treks, you follow the same six to eight people in the same four to six rooms for the entire 45 minutes. An episode of TNG, for example, might focus on Dr. Crusher, Counselor Troy, and say Data, and one new character, and no new sets. When you do that, you have the advantage of these well-worn, long-standing characters that through certain episodes that focus on them, and even ones that don't, get developed in a nuanced way, not just broad strokes and walking plot devices. Case in point here is the scene with Picard and his former doctor on the Stargazer. Really good scene, well acted, well written, but it just felt a tad rushed. Now, part of this is, of course, that Picard is a brand new show with brand new characters, so there is a lot of information they have to convey, and some of these problems may be alleviated by the end of season one. So if there's anything we can take away from episode two, in my opinion, it's that the overarching plot of this new Star Trek show is going to be something special. The execution, however, does need work. I hope they slow things down in future episodes. Oh, and I could do with less lens flares, too. There are times when uh, I'm working on a shot, I think, oh, this would be really cool if there's a lens flip. But I know it's too much and I apologize.